I sat on the floor in the small room, next to the closed and locked door. Not far from me was a desk and a chair. On the desk sat two computer screens. Above the desk, fastened to the wall, was a large flat screen television. I paid no attention to the images on the screens. I'd seen all I needed to, all I wanted to. So I waited with my back against the wall. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't stop tonguing the loose tooth in the back left side of my mouth. I already had one of my molars in my pants pocket. The other ones would be coming out soon, especially if I kept messing with them. Every once in a while, my tongue would slip past my molars and into the gash through my cheek. Whenever I did that, the thing would start bleeding again. And before long, I would have to spit blood out onto the floor next to me. On the floor between my feet were two tools, a small crowbar and a large kitchen knife. They were ready to go. I was just waiting. Finally, after the longest two hours of my life, I heard footsteps approaching the door. I got to my feet and slipped the small crowbar into my belt at my back. Then I reached down and grabbed the knife in my right hand just as the keypad outside started beeping. He was coming. I was ready. Can you believe this place? Alanis asked as we stood in the living room of our new apartment. I put a hand on my chin, stroking my goatee as I walked to the nearest wall. Hmm, I said, inspecting the wall. Oh my God, you're such an- Stop! I said, raising a hand. You asked me a question, I'm trying to answer it. Although I was facing away from her, I knew my sister was rolling her eyes. Adjusting my head so she could see what I was doing, I leaned forward, stuck my tongue out, and tasted the wall. Then I made a face and pantomimed spitting. Yes, I believe this place, I said, shaking my head. Alanis laughed. (laughs) Such an idiot. What does it taste like? Home, I said, grinning at her. I can't believe we're related, she said. Let's go get the rest of the stuff. As we walked out into the hallway, I marveled at the plush carpet and fancy lighting fixtures. I'd never lived anywhere so nice before. And despite the joke I'd made in the apartment, I was having a hard time believing we actually lived here now. I kept thinking that the apartment manager would show up and tell us there was a problem with our applications, or they'd forgotten to add a zero to the rent. It seemed strange that such a nice place would fall within our price range. It just seemed too good to be true, especially after our last place kicked us out for no apparent reason, saying we'd violated the lease by lying on our applications. I tried arguing with the apartment manager there, and I'd even almost come to blows with him at one point. Thankfully, Alanis had been there and had kept me from hitting the guy. If she hadn't done that, I'd be in jail right now. We had no money for a lawyer, so Alanis convinced me just to drop it and find another place to live. Thankfully, we found this place. It worked out better than I could have hoped. It just goes to show that what looks like a curse at first can turn out to be a blessing. Our apartment was on the second floor of the five-story building. We took the elevator down to the lobby and headed out to our sedan. The doorman, a straight-backed, early 40s guy named Vernon, smiled and opened the door for us. Thanks, Vern, Alana said, grinning at the man. Vernon followed her with his gaze, clearly appreciating my sister's beauty. I'd seen that look on Guise's face ever since she came into her own around 16. She even did some modeling work when she could find it. I ignored his staring and followed my sister. After unloading the sedan, we used the freight elevator at the back of the building to start unloading the U-Haul we'd parked at the back loading dock. Both Alanis and I stayed pretty fit, so we made quick work of moving the furniture in. As I was taking one of the last boxes up, one of the other second floor apartment doors opened. A stunningly beautiful woman with dark hair and large brown eyes stepped out. Hey there, 
she said. Moving in? I glanced down at the box I was carrying, suddenly tongue-tied. Stupid question, I guess, she said. I'm Erica. Lewis, I said, putting the box down to shake her hand. Alanis came out of our apartment down the hall. I gestured toward her. That's my sister, Alanis. Erica and Alanis shook hands and exchanged compliments about each other's hair. Welcome to the building, Erica said. I've only lived here for about a month, but I like it so far. I'm sure I'll see you around. She headed toward the elevator. I watched her go. When Erica was out of earshot, Alanis turned to me and waggled her eyebrows. She's a babe. Yeah, I said. If she were president, she'd be Abraham Lincoln. (laughs) We both laughed at the Wayne's World quote and then finished unloading the U-Haul. On our third night in the place, Alanis' boyfriend came over. I answered the door when he knocked. Hey, Corey, I said, stepping aside to let him in. He was a couple of inches shorter than me, with curly brown blonde hair and blue eyes. He and my sister had been together for over a year, and I liked him. He was always nice, and Alanis never had a bad thing to say about him, aside from some normal minor complaints that weren't really genuine issues, just my sister's way of blowing off steam. How are you? Corey asked, walking in with a backpack over one shoulder and a bottle of wine in one hand. I'm good, man. Enjoying the new place. Damn, Corey said, looking around. Yeah, this is nice. How did you find this place again? I shrugged. Alanis found it. Said she saw an ad online or something. This is great. Hey, babe, Alanis said, coming out of her room. She showed him around the apartment while I got two wine glasses out and set them on the dining room table for them. I also got out the corkscrew so Corey wouldn't have to go hunting for it. The three of us chatted for a little while before I went back to my room, leaving the lovebirds to watch a movie in the living room. As the days turned into weeks and the novelty of the new apartment faded a little, Alanis and I settled into our normal routine. We both had our own jobs and friends, but we generally spent a couple of nights a week together, making dinner and watching stupid shows and joking around. Corey came over two or three times a week their relationship seemed as good as ever. I kept hoping to run into Erica again, but I never did. At first, I guessed we had opposing schedules. But three weeks after we'd moved in, I stepped out of my apartment one Saturday afternoon to run down to the corner store for some beer and snacks. I saw that Erica's apartment door was open. My stomach filled with butterflies, and I had to work up the courage to simply go over and knock on the open door. Hello? I called. Yes? A man called from within. Then I noticed the boxes stacked near the entryway. Um, is Erica around? A mid-fifties man with dark hair came around the corner and into view. You're looking for Erica? He asked. Yeah, I said, sensing something was wrong. Does she still live here? I'm her father, the man said. She disappeared a week ago. How do you know her? Disappeared? I asked. How do you know my daughter? He asked again. Oh, I don't, really. My sister and I met her briefly when we were moving in three weeks ago. I haven't seen her since. The man shook his head. I'm sorry, but I have to finish moving her stuff out. He turned to head back into the apartment. Wait, when did she disappear? A week ago? Yes, the man said half-turning. April 14th. The last time anyone saw her, she was walking out of this building, heading toward Midtown. He disappeared back into the apartment. I walked down to the elevator, moving on autopilot, thinking about Erica. I'd never known anyone who had just disappeared before. It was creepy. I took the elevator down and walked out past Vernon. As I walked, I thought about what might have happened to Erica. Then, my thoughts turned to how I hadn't seen anyone else coming and going from the second floor since running into Erica that one time. 
Sometimes I saw people in the lobby, and once or twice, I shared an elevator with someone who was going to one of the higher floors, but that was about it. It seemed like there weren't many people living in the apartment building, just a handful. Come to think of it, we rarely heard any noise from elsewhere in the building. No heavy footsteps, no running water, no thump of bass from a movie or loud music. Nothing. It was very strange, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. So one night after work, I decided to check out the third floor before calling it a night. I stepped off the elevator only to see that the third floor wasn't finished. There were piles of construction supplies and equipment lying around. There wasn't even any carpet on the floors. The lights in the hallway were on, but I still had an eerie feeling as I walked down the hall. The doors to the apartments were all open, plastic sheets hanging over the entrances. I ducked into one of the apartments and tried to turn the lights on, but the switch didn't work. So I pulled out my phone and used the flashlight. The floor plan was the same as our apartment, but it was just a shell. There were no light fixtures, no faucets or plumbing fixtures, and the walls were all unpainted sheetrock. I didn't think the building was brand new, so I figured they were doing some renovations. But I had never heard construction going on. I'd never seen construction workers coming and going. It was strange, but it explained why I didn't see many people around the building. After looking around for a little while longer, I headed down to my apartment, stomach growling. When I told Alanis about it, she agreed that it was odd. Maybe they ran out of money for renovations, she said. If so, why would this place be so cheap? I asked. Oh yeah, good point. Maybe they just do all the work during the weekdays while we're at work. Yeah, maybe, I said. That was a fair point. We both worked normal nine to five schedules. It was possible all the loud construction was happening during the day. The next day, I asked the doorman about it on my way to work. I'd since learned that Vernon worked the three to midnight shift. This other guy, Earl, worked from 6 a.m. to three. From midnight to six in the morning, there was no doorman. Yeah. They do some construction during the day usually, Earl said when I asked. So they don't bother the tenants. How many people live here right now? I asked. Offhand? I think about half the units are occupied right now, give or take a few. I thanked Earl and headed to work. The sound of a woman screaming outside pulled me out of the book I was reading in the living room. It was a cool spring night, and I had opened a couple of windows to enjoy the weather, so the scream wasn't hard to hear. Wondering what was going on, I jumped up from the couch and looked out the window. Help! A woman screamed, running down the sidewalk on the other side of the narrow street. She had jogging clothes on, the kind designed to reflect car headlights. As she ran, she pulled out a phone. I assumed she was calling 911. The sound of tire squealing came from down the block. I looked that way just in time to see the brake lights of an SUV disappearing around the corner at the end of the block. Looking the other way, I saw the jogger approaching a man lying in the middle of the street. He looked pretty messed up, probably because he'd just been run over by an SUV. It took me a moment to recognize him. Even when I did, I had a hard time believing what I was seeing. Alanis came out of her room, What's all the screaming about? I moved from the window and stopped her before she could get close enough to see out. I don't think you want to see it. See what? What do you mean? She asked. I think Corey was just hit by a car outside. Her eyebrows shot up and her mouth dropped open. Are you kidding? I shook my head, grabbing her gently by the shoulders. I'm going to go down and see if there's anything I can do. You can do what you want, but I got to tell you, it doesn't look good. Alanis knocked my hands away and ran toward the apartment door. It was the reaction I thought she would have, but I felt I had to warn her. I ran out after her, bolting down the stairs and into the lobby. The ambulance is on the way, 
Vernon said when he saw us. He had his phone in one hand. Did you see who did it? I asked. Vernon shook his head sadly. Alanis and I ran to the street, joining the jogger lady beside Corey. My sister slapped her hands over her mouth. Oh my God, she said into her palms. It didn't look good, not at all. They didn't even slow down, the jogger said, clearly sickened by the hit and run. They just drove over him and kept going like it was nothing. Alanis dropped to her knees and reached out for Corey's head, but I stopped her. Don't move him, I said. Just hold his hand, talk to him. Oh, Christ, the jogger said. You know him? Yeah, I said. We do. The ambulance arrived a few minutes later and did their best to stabilize him before rushing him to the nearest hospital. They let Alanis ride in the ambulance. I told her I'd meet her at the hospital with the car. Both the jogger lady and I talked to the police, telling them what we'd seen. The jogger lady had seen more than me, so when she was done giving her statement, I pulled her aside. What kind of car was it? It was an SUV, she said. I already told the police. Tell me, what kind? Did you get the license plate? The lady shook her head. It was a Chevy Suburban, but it was the strangest thing. There was no license plate on it. Corey was dead by the time they got him to the hospital. He couldn't be resuscitated. Alanis watched him die in the ambulance. She was distraught, so I was the one who phoned his mom and dad about the incident. They lived an hour outside of town, so they got there as soon as they could. It was a stressful night, and by the time Alanis and I got home, we were both exhausted. Alanis passed out on the couch after drinking half a bottle of wine. I tried to get some sleep, but my mind kept churning. So after a half hour of lying in my bed, I decided to go for a walk. But I didn't leave the apartment. Instead, I used the stairs to go up to the fourth floor. Unlike the third floor, the fourth was finished. It looked exactly like my floor, except for the numbers on the doors, which were all closed. As I walked down the hall, I heard the faint sound of a television from apartment 412. I stopped on the plush carpet and listened, wondering who was living in there. After a moment, I walked down the hallway, listening for sounds from other apartments. I heard none. Of course, it was the middle of the night. Maybe the other residents were all sleeping. I turned back around and walked down the hall again, realizing that apartment 412 was two floors directly above our apartment, 212. Back in the stairwell, I decided to go up to the top floor. I trudged up the steps and opened the door to the fifth floor, only to find that it wasn't finished. What the hell? I said to myself. It was exactly like the third floor, with construction materials around and plastic sheets hanging over the apartment doors. The first floor didn't have any units, as far as I knew. It was where the staff offices were, along with the gym and the mailroom. Why would they leave the third and fifth floors unfinished? I wondered. Then again, I didn't know anything about refinishing apartment buildings. Still, it seemed strange and illogical. After looking around for a bit, I headed down to the second floor. When I stepped back into my apartment, I heard Alanis sobbing on the couch. I went over and sat next to her, and I held her hand until she fell asleep again. Alanis took the next day off work, but I had to go in. I told her to call me if she needed anything at all. When I hadn't heard from her by lunch, I decided to call her. She didn't pick up. I didn't think much of it. I figured she was asleep or just didn't want to talk. So I texted her and asked her to let me know if she needed anything. By the time I left work for the day, she hadn't texted or called. So I called again wondering if she wanted me to pick up anything on my way home. She didn't answer. I started to get worried. When I got back to the apartment building, Vernon was there. He opened the lobby door for me. Hey, Vern, I said. 
Have you seen my sister today? Yes, I have, he said. She left about an hour ago, shortly after I came on shift. Didn't say where she was going. She hasn't come back? Vernon shook his head. Not that I've seen. Of course, she could have used the back entrance. I thanked him and headed up. The apartment was empty. No Alanis. I stood in the doorway to her bedroom and called her several times. The phone was no longer ringing. It went straight to voicemail. I called a few of her friends and asked if they'd seen her. As I spoke to Alanis's friends, I walked around her room, looking for anything that could tell me about her mindset. Everything seemed to be in its place. Everything but a small figurine Corey had given her as a housewarming gift. Alanis loved sea turtles, and the figurine was of a sea turtle riding on a turquoise wave. It was on the floor, right in front of the built-in bookshelf in her bedroom. I picked it up off the floor and put it back on the shelf where it belonged, wondering what it meant that it had been on the floor. I knew Alanis wasn't the type to do anything drastic, but I was still worried about her. Maybe she just needs space, I thought, some time alone. So I decided to stop calling her for a little while. I told myself she would be back before long, but I was wrong. By three o'clock that morning, she still wasn't back and I was starting to panic. I couldn't stop thinking about what Erica's dad had told me, about how she'd disappeared, about how the last time anyone had seen her was when she left the apartment building Although he didn't say for sure, I assumed that the last person to see her was one of the doormen, Vernon or Earl. Without thinking, I went down to the lobby to ask Vernon about Erica's disappearance. But when I got down there, I realized it was three hours after Vernon went off shift. He was gone for the night. Earl wouldn't be on shift until six o'clock. I went back up to the second floor, but as I approached our apartment, I stopped. I didn't want to go back in there. It felt suffocating in the apartment. I thought about going outside for a walk, but instead, I headed to the stairwell and went upstairs to the third floor. The place was unchanged. No progress had been made since my last visit to the floor. All the construction materials were in the same places. All the doors were still open, plastic sheets hanging. Actually, that wasn't right. The door to apartment 312 was closed. It hadn't been the last time I'd been on the third floor. I stepped at the door, yanking the plastic sheet out of the way, and then trying the doorknob. The door was locked. What the hell? I whispered. Why? I thought about the turtle figurine on the floor in front of the built-in bookshelf. Something wasn't right. I turned and walked back to the stairwell, lost in thought, just letting my feet take me where they would. I was faintly aware that my feet were taking me upstairs, to the fifth floor. I stopped in front of apartment 512. It was locked. 312, 512, both locked. We lived in 212. I ran down to the fourth floor and stopped in front of apartment 412. Just like the previous night, I heard the faint sounds of a television from inside the apartment. Turning around, I ran back down to the second floor and back into our apartment. I made a beeline for the bookshelf in Alanis' bedroom. It was a recessed bookshelf built into the wall near her bathroom door. The wall in question was up against the kitchen on the other side. I looked at the bookshelf and the surrounding wall before heading out to the kitchen. There was a pantry against that same wall but the depth of the pantry didn't account for the depth of the shared wall. Hurrying back into Alanis' bedroom, I approached the bookshelf slowly, studying it. I put my hands against the edge of the middle shelf and pushed. Nothing happened. It felt solid. Am I insane? I thought. This is ridiculous. Despite these thoughts, I pulled Alanis' books off the shelves and searched for some kind of hidden panel. I found none. I am insane, I thought, turning and leaning against the recessed bookshelf. As I put my weight on it, 
The entire thing shifted a half inch backward. I stood up and faced it again. Reaching out, I grabbed the middle shelf and pulled it back toward me. There was a click, and then the whole shelf swung inward soundlessly, revealing a dark and narrow landing that was part of a cramped staircase. What in the actual fuck? I whispered, looking at the staircase. It was metal and solid looking. I pulled out my phone and turned the flashlight on. Stepping through the hidden doorway and onto the staircase, I shined my light up and down. I couldn't see how far the stairs went, but I had a feeling I knew. I moved up the cramped stairs, noting how steep they were. They had to be steep to fit in such a narrow space. When I reached the third floor landing, I stopped at the secret door, noticing the simple metal handle on the inside of it. Using the handle, I pushed the door forward and then pulled it back again. The two movements detached some kind of mechanism, allowing the bookshelf to swing open on its own. Then I moved through the doorway and into apartment 312. It was unfurnished. No one was living in it, but I'd seen all I needed to see. I closed the hidden doorway and moved back down to my apartment. I stepped back into Alanis' room, pulling the bookshelf closed behind me. I opened my phone app to call 911, but a figure darted out of Alanis' bathroom before I could hit the green call button. I brought my head up and jumped back instinctively, barely comprehending anything as Earl swung a small crowbar at me. The metal crashed into my phone, smashing the screen and hurting my hand. I turned and ran into the open living room and kitchen area, grabbing an open bottle of wine from the dining room table. I spun around and threw the bottle at Earl. It bounced off his head, buying me enough time to grab the corkscrew from off the table. It was a wood-handled corkscrew, just a simple piece of twisted metal attached to a hefty wood handle. Without thinking, I grabbed the tool in my right fist, the sharp metal sticking up between my middle and ring fingers, and I lunged at Earl. He saw me coming and swung the crowbar at my face, this time leading with the wedge end of it. I felt the thing hit me in my left cheek, but it wasn't enough to knock me off my attack trajectory. I was too full of adrenaline and anger to let it stop me. The skin of Earl's neck popped as I punched him with the corkscrew. He didn't seem to notice at first. He yanked the crowbar out of my face and tried to swing it again, but I got my left arm up, blocking the blow. I punched him again, this time in the face. The metal tip of the tool bounced off his left cheekbone and sank into his eye. I pulled it out and stepped back, surprised at what I'd done. Earl dropped the crowbar and stumbled back, sucking in a ragged breath before screaming as he brought his hands to his left eye. But he was also bleeding badly from where I'd hit him in the neck. He backpedaled into Alanis' room, toppling back onto her bed as he writhed and screamed. That screaming was terrible. It was like a million nails on a million chalkboards. Stop! I screamed at him vaguely aware that something was wrong with my mouth. But he didn't stop. He fell off Alanis' bed, leaving a trail of blood behind him, and started writhing on the floor. Shut up! I shouted. He didn't. His screams grew louder. I dropped the corkscrew and grabbed the crowbar. Rushing over to him, I hit him in the head with the crowbar until he stopped screaming and stopped moving. I slumped to my knees next to Earl's body. Time seemed to slow and speed up at the same time. My mind retreated into itself, and it only returned to reality because of the pain that became too great to ignore. I reached up with my left hand and felt the place on my left cheek where he'd hit me with the crowbar. I was bleeding pretty good. As I pressed the skin, my finger slipped through a vertical gash and into my mouth, jostling a couple of molars that the metal tool had knocked loose. I winced and, unable to help myself, tongued the loose teeth until one of them came free. I spit the tooth out, along with a good amount of blood. Dropping the crowbar, I grabbed the tooth with my right hand and put it in my pocket. Getting to my feet, I walked to the bathroom and grabbed a bunch of toilet paper. I balled it up and held it to my cheek. Then I picked the crowbar up again, walked back to the secret passage and started down the stairs to the first floor. 
The door at the bottom of the stairwell was wide open, surely left that way by Earl. There was a large television attached to one wall. The television showed eight different views of my apartment. On one of them, I could see Earl, dead on the floor of my sister's room. On another, I could see Alanis's empty shower. Then there was a wide view of the living room and even a view of my room and my bathroom. There were hidden cameras all around our place. I turned my attention to two computer monitors atop a desk and saw something similar. Only each of the monitors had four different views of different apartments. A stunning dark-haired woman sat on a couch in one feed, eating cereal as she watched television. Although the feed didn't say, I assumed this was apartment 412. The woman was a night owl. As I looked at her, something clicked into place. This woman, my sister, and Erica. They all looked similar. Dark hair, dark eyes, very beautiful. This was some kind of sick sexual thing. I thought about how Alanis had been the one to discover the apartment. I now knew it wasn't a mistake. Someone had targeted her. Then I thought about how we'd been kicked out of our old apartment for some bullshit reason. Someone powerful was behind this. Someone with too much time and money on their hands. No one else could let a prime piece of real estate sit mostly empty like this. Not to mention the cost of installing a secret staircase throughout the whole damn building. Or maybe even two secret staircases. If Erica's apartment had one, which I was guessing it did. I set the crowbar down on the desk and grabbed the mouse. I figured out how to cycle through the camera feeds, but I didn't see Alanis on any of them. So I turned my attention to the desk drawers. There wasn't much in them. Nothing that gave me any idea where Alanis was. And the rest of the small room was empty. I walked to the door, unlocked it, and stepped out into a hallway I'd never been in before. The door was blank, and there was an electronic keypad on the wall next to it. So before letting the door close all the way, I moved back into the room and grabbed the crowbar, using it to keep the door from shutting. Then I walked through a door and found myself in the lobby, just past the gym entrance. The door read, private. I turned and walked back to the surveillance room, picking up the crowbar and letting the door close behind me. I needed to find out where Alanis was, and I only had one way to do it. The beep of the keypad on the other side of the door was my indication that he was there. I stood with my back against the wall next to the doorway, so the door would obscure me when he stepped inside. The crowbar was tucked into my belt at my back. I had gone back up to my apartment to grab a large kitchen knife, thinking it would be more intimidating and quicker if I had to do something. The door swung open. Morning, Vernon said as he stepped inside. I had turned the chair so its back was facing the door. I figured it would buy me enough time to do what I had to do before he noticed that Earl wasn't sitting in it. And it worked, just like I hoped. I stepped up behind him as the door closed, grabbing a handful of his short hair in my left hand while pressing the tip of the kitchen knife to the side of his throat with my other hand. You make a sudden move? I plunge this knife into your throat. I'm no doctor, but I think the carotid artery is somewhere around here. Whoa, Lewis, Vernon said. You got the wrong idea, man. I'm just a doorman. He started to raise his hands. Keep your fucking hands down, I said, pressing the tip into his skin and drawing blood. Okay, okay, just listen, will you? I'm just a doorman. I watch the cameras for security. You need cameras and showers for security? I growled. Okay, look, listen, it's him. It's all his idea. He's a sicko, man, but he's a rich sicko. You know how it goes, right? Who? Who is it? Where is he? You ever heard the name Rufo Bilson? Vernon asked. No. Who the hell is that? He's a billionaire, man. One of the billionaires that you never hear about because he wants it that way. He has a whole fucking system set up. He owns a modeling agency. That's how he finds them. How he gets all their information. They give it to him, along with their fucking headshots. And he chooses the one he likes. He has a certain taste and he gets them to move here. And then what? What happens after they disappear? Suddenly, he wasn't so talkative. 
What happens, Vern? I asked, twisting the knife. I don't know, man. I don't know what he does with them. Bullshit, you know. Where is he? Where is my sister? Again, he clammed up. Vern, tell me where my sister is if you want to keep breathing. Okay, okay. He has a place in the basement. I'm sure he's down there with her now. Show me. I will. I will. But you gotta ease up with the knife. It hurts, man. I'll ease up with the knife once you take me to my sister. We walked out of the room and down the hall, moving slowly. We went through a door at the end of the hallway. Through the door was a staircase. We walked down the stairs and stopped at another door. I could hear a man's voice interspersed with faint whimpering sounds from inside. I knew without seeing that it was Alanis whimpering. The door had a keypad. Enter the code, I whispered. Vernon reached out toward the keypad, then stopped. Let me go, and I'll tell you the code. I'll let you go after you tell me the code. I don't believe you. You'll kill me. But I thought you said you were just doing your job, just following orders, just making an honest living. Vernon was silent. I pressed the knife even deeper. Open the door. Okay, okay, he whined. He punched in a code and the door unlocked. I eased the knife out of his neck and brought it down to my side. See, that wasn't so hard, I said. Vernon relaxed. I thought you would kill me, he said. I thought about it, I said, relaxing my left hand, releasing his hair. I really did. I stepped away enough for Vernon to turn toward me so I could look into his eyes. Then I jammed the knife into his stomach, aiming it up under his ribs. But that was before I watched some of the recorded footage. I said to him as he gasped against the knife. And I saw you, Vern. I saw you drugging my sister. And I saw you carrying her out through that secret passage with Earl. So after that, I knew I would kill you. I pulled the knife out and opened the door, letting Vernon collapse to the floor. The space I stepped into was a long room partitioned off with half wall sections. The floor was tile and there were several drains placed along the middle. There were two ratty mattresses, one on either side of the door, both placed under shackles attached to the wall. The mattress on my left was empty. Erica lay passed out on the mattress to my right, her arms shackled to the wall. She wore nothing but frilly lingerie. I could hear the man talking, Rufo Bilzen. He had a reedy, nasally voice and he was commanding my sister to do something she didn't want to do. Gripping the bloody knife as tight as I could, I marched toward the sound of Bilzen's voice. I found him and my sister in the second partitioned space on the right side of the room. There was a stripper pole on a small stage set up against the wall. My sister was wearing lingerie, dancing awkwardly on the stage, a look of despair on her face. She had some kind of strange collar around her neck, like the kind that shocks dogs when they bark. Sitting in a chair facing the pole was a skinny bald man with glasses. He held a remote in one hand, no doubt to shock Alanis when she didn't do what he wanted. Alanis saw me. She stopped dancing, hope flickering in her eyes for a moment. Bilzen noticed this and turned in his seat to see what was happening. He stood up and turned toward me, eyes widening. Hey, listen, he said in his reedy voice. This isn't what it looks like, okay? I took a step toward him. He was a small man. I probably outweighed him by 40 pounds. He took a step back, toward the stage and the pole and my sister. I can give you money, he said. You and your sister will never have to work again. Wouldn't you like that? I took another step toward him. He took another step back. My sister launched herself at the man, crashing into his back. They hit the floor at my feet and I stomped on Bilzen's right hand, which still held the remote. He screamed and let go of the device, which I kicked away. Alanis grabbed him on the sides of his head and slammed his face into the tile floor, grunting with the effort. When she tried it again, Bilzen managed to get his hands under him to keep her from slamming his head again. I kicked his hands away. She slammed his face into the tile floor again and again and again. I stepped aside as blood ran down toward the nearest drain in the gently sloping floor. When she was done, I helped her to her feet and took the collar off her. He killed Corey, Alanis said, catching her breath. 
He described it to me like he was proud of it. Said that he was the only one who could have me. I looked down at him. He won't be having anyone else. That's for damn sure. We left Bilzen on the floor, bleeding out of his ruined face. If he wasn't dead, he was close to it. Together, we found the keys and freed a groggy Erica. The three of us made our way upstairs. My phone had been smashed by Earl, and neither Alanis nor Erica knew where their phones were. So I left them in the lobby of the apartment building and walked out to the sidewalk. The city was just waking up, the sun peeking over the skyline. I asked a morning jogger to call 911 for me. The guy looked at my face and saw the gash in my cheek. Although it wasn't bleeding badly anymore, I knew it still looked pretty rough. He called 911 and handed me the phone. When the police and paramedics were on their way, I angled the phone away from my ear and looked at the jogger. You wouldn't know of any good apartments for rent around here, would you? Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.